And I, I kind of went back and forth as to what we ought to preach on this particular weekend. I actually considered, with it being Labor Day weekend, that I would preach on a biblical view of work. Work is not a four-letter word. I thought about that, and I thought what else would catch that, but the kids would be totally confused, because if they can count letters, they would go, well, it certainly is a four-letter word, <laughs> mom and dad. So uh, then I, as I thought about where we are in this whole First Corinthians encounter, and how we are, have been immersed for several weeks now in 1 Corinthians 13, it seemed good to me to step away from that a little bit, not completely, and to take a look at a different facet of this that challenges us in a phrase that we're going to look at today, the love of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. I'm going to ask you to stand if, if you would. Find that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you, we have the text on the screen for you. Not intended at all ever to be a substitute for you gazing upon your copy of Scripture, but as a a help in case you don't have immediate access to the Scripture. We want you to see the Word of God as well as hear the Word of God. It's an enhancement so that we might do the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, very brief. We read the context earlier, 11 to 21. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. We've just read what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord grip us today and and perhaps work in us so that 1 Corinthians 13 will, will increasingly saturate us. Work in us to come to terms with the love of Christ and ask ourselves the honest question, what difference, if any, has our love of Christ made in our lives? Thank you. Please be seated. So that we don't get too far away from 1 Corinthians 13, I wanted just to read to you again today 1 through 8. It's where we've been living the last several weeks. Because in this, Paul, remember, he he says, he tells us what love does, what love does not do, what love is, what love is not, and and how necessary love is because if certain, if love is missing from our lives, then, then fantastic accomplishments Incredible zeal is nothing. Listen to what he says here. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love. I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, or as I like to render that, love keeps on loving. When we think about this, these two brief verses in the light of that passage in Paul's previous letter, this is his second letter here to the church at Corinth, and his previous letter to Corinth, I face it and I ask these questions, and I ask them of myself, and I ask them of you today. Does the love of Christ control your life? 
What have you concluded regarding the death of Christ? And how has the love of Christ impacted for whom you live? Now, that's a rough way of saying it, but that's the grammatically correct way of saying it. It would be very easy to say, how has the love of Christ impacted who you live for? But Georgia Bird and I both know that would not be appropriate. Those three questions. We've got to wrestle with them today until they pin us down. And we say, uncle, I give. So in this passage, I want us to look at these three things for a few minutes this morning. First of all, does the love of Christ control your life? I remember I said earlier that in various translations, uh, the love of Christ constrains us. A different translation, I think, I forget which ones, the love of Christ compels us. And that's, those are constrained. We, uh, we think of being constrained. If I say constrained, uh, you might get this picture of we're kind of nudged on, we're encouraged, we're exhorted. And you can end up with compels, the love of Christ compels. We, we encounter that and it has a compelling aspect to it. But the word is better rendered controls. And when we face this love of Christ controls us, we are faced with a grammatical, theological challenge. We've been doing a little diagramming on Wednesday night at prayer meeting just to get a sense of the flow of things. And uh, it's hard to do that in this setting. If I had a whiteboard, I could, I could do that for you. But here's what you're facing grammatically in this phrase, love of Christ. It's a genitive construction. I'm not going to bog you down in grammar today because some of you are saying, wait, preacher, I left that behind in school. But you know, to get the flow of thought in a passage, it's good to have a sense of, of grammar. This is a genitive construction, love of Christ. But here's the question, which one is it? Is it a subjective genitive? In other words, where Christ is the subject, the love that Christ has for us? Is that what it is? The love that Christ has for us controls us? Or is it an objective genitive where we are the subject and Christ is the object? The love that we have for Christ. Because you see, the construction both in English and in Greek, allows for either of those. And context dictate which one it is. Now, in English, you, you often have to go jump one or another. But we're not just looking at words here today. We're looking at divinely inspired truth. And so when you ask the question, is it subjective, the love that Christ has for us, or is it objective, the love that we have for Christ? The biblical theological answer is yes. It is both. It is both. Look at 1 John, a couple of verses in 1 John. Chapter 4, verse 10, it shows us how, <clears throat> how the love that Christ has for us is an initiating, uh, an energizing, an impacting, activating reality in the life of those who have received it. See, it's one thing to say, Jesus loves me, this I know. There can be knowledge of the love of God toward us, but there needs to be the actual saving encounter of the love of God for us. Listen to 1 John 14. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, and in you, the context dictates not that we loved God first, but that he loved us first and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation, they remember, is the, is the sin-bearing, wrath-appeasing. He satisfies God's divine justice by taking in himself our sins, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 21. 
For he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin, him who knew no sin, so that we, parentheses, sinners, <laughs> might become the righteousness of God in him, the great exchange in the gospel. We didn't love him. In fact, Paul says in Romans, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The death of, the, of Jesus Christ on the cross for sinners was not in response to some aching desire in the hearts of sinners for him. It was the response of God's love for sinners who did not love him. So, so you have this in terms of a, a priority, if you want to go sequencing on this, the love Christ has for sinners is first, and when it is focused in the gospel and those who receive the gospel, it inevitably results in our love for Christ. 1 John 4, 19, same, same chapter. We love because he first loved us. That's the result. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. So the, the answer to the phrase is yes. Christ, as the subject, showed his love for us unmistakably, infallibly, without question. But it wasn't simply a, look how much I love you. It was a transaction between the Son and the Father so that when Jesus satisfied the divine wrath of God on behalf of all of those who would come to believe in him. For, folks, make no mistake about it. People get confused about this. Jesus did not satisfy the divine wrath of God for every human being who ever lived. When he died, Pharaoh was burning in hell. But he did satisfy the divine wrath of God for all those who, who would come to believe in him. And when the good news would come in the fullness of time, in your life, maybe you haven't, you haven't been there yet. Maybe, maybe you haven't encountered that yet. But many in here have. Where the day came, and it may have been the first time you heard the gospel, it may have been the thousandth time you heard the gospel. But one day you heard the gospel. It spoke to you. And the way you knew it spoke to you, Paul said to the Thessalonians, we looked at this last Sunday night, that our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power. Remember the time? Do you remember the time, the first time the gospel came to you in power, that is in saving power? You, you were well lived with repentance for sin. I've sinned against a holy God. And, and almost at one and the same time, and, the, and yet he has given me his son. His son lived perfectly when I had not. His son died where I should have. And you found yourself constrained compelled and in the reception of the gospel and repentance for sin and faith in Christ alone controlled by the love of God the love of Christ controls us remember when we read through 1 Corinthians 13 the first time I told you in fact we did this like a Sunday before we actually got into 1 Corinthians 13 I said I want you to read this and consider two things how it is a portrait of Jesus Christ. Every line in there. 
is a picture of Christ. It's, it's an artist's divinely rendered conception. If you want to know what love is, look at the life of Christ, but don't look at it with a mishmash emotional. There are, are objective demonstrations and instructions for what the love of Christ is. I said, so see that in 1 Corinthians 13. I said, but I want you to look at it again and ask yourself, is this seen in me? Is this seen in me? I realize when we speak like this, we have an enemy of our souls who, who's whispering in somebody's ear right now, oh, come on, nobody's perfect. It's not a call to perfection. It's a call to continual repentance for sin when we find it in ourselves, a continual faith in Jesus Christ to see increasingly how he is altogether lovely, to have expanded before us just how much he paid when he paid the penalty for our sin. It is the prov provocation by the Spirit to become more like him because the love of Christ controls us. Second thing I want to ask is, so what have you concluded regarding this, this death of Christ? When we're talking about the love of Christ, we're talking about it being shown in his life, sure, what we call his active righteousness, his death, his, his passive righteousness. Because Paul says you draw some conclusions when, when the love of Christ is controlling you. Verse 14, because we have concluded this. That one has died for all, therefore all died. Interesting what Paul does here with this, with this turn of, of, of phrase. He says the death of Jesus Christ doesn't just sort of demonstrate something. There is a demonstration there, but it goes beyond demonstration. It's not just demonstration. The death of Jesus Christ brings to those for whom he died a death for them. What do you mean? Well, before we were saved, we were dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 teaches. And when we were saved, we died to that. Right? That's what the Scripture teaches. We died to that. We died to the dominion of sin in our lives. Remember, we've talked about this before. We did not die to the condition of sin in our lives. We still live in a fallen world. We still live with sinful choices. We still live with, in bodies that Paul says are decaying. We're not in our glorified body yet. So though we are saved from the dominion of sin, that's justification... And though we are being saved from the, from the power of sin, that's sanctification, we have not been completely rescued from the condition of sin because that will happen at glorification when we're taken to heaven. Heaven's not a fallen place. Heaven's a glorious place. In heaven, there are no sinful options. In heaven, there are no sinful inclinations. It's one of the reasons we call it heaven. <laughs> it's one of the reasons we don't call this heaven. Not in heaven yet. He died, and his death meant that all for whom he died, died. That happened transactionally in eternity past, but it happens in a real time and space event in your life and in my life. You could ask the question, when did you die for the sake of Christ? We're not talking about martyrdom. There are people all over the world today as we worship in freedom and unmolested and un unconcerned about being arrested here for worshiping. There are people all over the world who will have that experience today and some will die. Some will pay the ultimate price, the martyrs. But when did you die? Have you ever died to self? 
not completely eradicated, but died to its dominion. Paul says that's a reality. It's not something he'd like to see. It's not a wishful thinking. Have you concluded that? We concluded that one has died for all, therefore all have died. So we're thinking about how, how the love of Christ, the love Christ has for us and in and, and, and being saved, our saving response to the, to the love we have for Christ. Jesus says in John, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He says it in 1 John, and this is love to God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not a burden to anyone who's been born again. That's 1 John 5, 1. So we've looked at that. So we ask ourselves the question, have you concluded, made the right biblical saving conclusion that when I was saved, when the death of Jesus Christ was applied to me by the Holy Spirit and I was born again and expressed the reality of that new birth and repenting for my sin and trusting in Christ, when I was, did I die? To me. The third thing I ask is, how has the love of Christ impacted for whom you live? I've taught you this in different ways over the years that when I encounter somebody with the gospel, I ask them these questions. Who is Jesus Christ? And I want to listen. I, I want to give open-ended questions. If, if I've got to feed somebody who Jesus Christ is, and, and by the way, it's right to do that, but, it, but, but don't do that and, then, and let them parrot it back and think that something's happening there. There is a teaching time, but there's, there comes a time You know, you can buy a bicycle for a child. And if you've ever done that, I mean, I had five kids and about wore myself out running behind them, running along beside them, wobbly, wobbly, wobbly. Finally came, they took the training wheels off. But, you know, if, if all you ever have is a bicycle sitting in the, in the garage, when the child rides the bicycle for his, himself or herself, it belongs to them, doesn't it? So yes, it's right. Who is Jesus Christ? I ask that and I just sit and wait for a response. And if I get a shrug, it's okay. It's not criminal. It just means it lets me have a barometer where we are. We need to do some more teaching till it becomes theirs. We move beyond that. What did he come to do? A lot of people in Christendom are clear, I'll, I'll tell you, our, the Roman Catholics are clear on the person of Jesus Christ, who he is. They, they hit it every point at every turn. But on the work of Christ, they're heretical. So who is Jesus Christ? What did he come to do? And you listen. And I've told you before how we try to help children get beyond the Sunday school answers. Well, he died on the cross for my sins. That's a good Sunday school answer. That's true. It means they've been taught something. So I say, what does that mean? Because again, we're not dealing with cockatoos here who can simply repeat back what they've heard. And I get this sometimes. Well, it means he died on the cross for my sins. <laughs> so okay, all right, we're, we're, I hear that. I heard that a while ago. And you, and you probe, who is Jesus Christ? What did he come to do? And once you work through the person and work of Jesus Christ, which is, the, which is the essence of sharing the gospel with somebody, then you ask the question, and what difference, if any, has that made in your life? A lot of people know the gospel. In fact, Jesus said the demons believe. And tremble. What difference, if any, has that made in your life? How, is, how has it impacted you? And so he says this in verse 15, and he died for all, so he's following his thought there. Notice how he shifts his, his, his picture here. That those, there's a purpose clause, in order that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him 
who for their sake died and was raised. See the controlling impact of the love of Christ? He loves us. And his love for us is shown in the gospel. And we are brought to savingly respond to the gospel. He has control. He is the owner. You may remember those of you who were around years ago, Bob Shelton was famous for saying, he is the boss. That's what Lord means. So, is the love of Christ controlling your lives? So, I I usually do this with people. I'll, I'll pull out a sheet of paper and draw a timeline, whatever, all of us have a zero starting point, right? We have that in common. We were all born. <clears throat> and we draw out the timeline. However old you are today, whether that's 10 or 30, 50, 70, 80, we all have a timeline. I ask people to mark out your religious experiences on there, whatever they look like. And then ask them to look at that timeline, take that passage, say, mark on there when, if ever, and, and, and never is a legitimate answer. Nothing. You could say, I ceased living primarily for myself. That's what Paul says. And began to live primarily for Jesus Christ. Because you see, when you answer that, that's when you have zeroed in, not necessarily a day and a date, but a time in your life. That's when you're zeroing in on when you were savingly brought to Christ. When the love of Christ that was made known to you so gripped you and Paul is basically saying to the Corinthians that's missing in Corinth in his first letter to them it's the same thing that Jesus said through John to the church at Ephesus in those seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. You have left your first love. You're not being controlled by the love of Christ. And Christians, those who have a a biblically based ground of confidence that they, they belong to Jesus, that when they die they're going from here to be with Jesus are those who are and give evidence of being controlled by the love of Christ. Paul doesn't say this is the the aim. It would be nice if some people get there. What controls you, my friends? What controls you? Because, see, whatever controls us, whether we know it or not consciously, what controls us is really what we're counting on to get us from this world to the world which is to come. Joyce played a while ago a piece at the cross. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden on my back rolled away. That, that hymn was written thinking of John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress where when when, when Christian saw the cross, the burden that was on, of sin that was on his back rolled, remember, down into an empty tomb. Powerful picture. What controls us? Whatever controls us is our Savior, whether we ever bow to it and worship it or not. Because Paul says... In salvation, the love of Christ controls us. My prayer for myself, my prayer for all of you, my prayer for those with whom we are praying for together to come to know Christ is that that encounter would manifest itself in us that Jesus Christ controls us. Not absolutely but essentially. 
not 24-7 without slipping, but dominantly. That's why it's so important to know the love of Christ and to stare 1 Corinthians 13 in the face and pray, dear God, where I'm lacking this, work this in me. I want this love that that captures the essence of who Jesus Christ is to be in me. Because you see, if if it's not in me, if it's not increasingly in me, then what reason do I have to believe that Christ is in me? Love is the theme. Love is the theme. Not maudlin sentimentality, but objective grounded, agape, God-sent, life-transforming, drawing us to heaven, making us more like Jesus, love. I can't answer that question for you. I have to answer it for myself. Does the love of Christ, as described in 1 Corinthians 13 and many other places in the Bible, does that control me? But I pray that it is so for you. You'll have to answer that yourself. And for those of you who say, well, (laughs) I'm not a very loving person. There's no excuse for that if you claim to be a Christian. There's not. You know, we scoff at this movement today that says, well, we need to legitimize and recognize that there there can be gay Christians. We scoff at that. Substitute. Angry Christians, mean Christians, half-hearted Christians, preoccupied Christians, worldly Christians. I mean, no, no, a thousand times no. That may sound good and tickle ears, it's just not in the text. And this is, this is the manual by which we're measured. This is the source book. Who is Jesus Christ? What did he come to do? What difference has that made in your life? Does the love of the crucified and risen Jesus who died because we had earlier died (laughs) and then we needed to die We were dead in trespasses and sins. We needed to die to our sins, and his death opened the door for that when the Spirit takes his death, burial, and resurrection and applies it to our lives so that we now live. We live by the love of Christ, and we live to love Christ. And when we love Christ, guess what? We'll love God. When we love God, guess what? We'll love others. You see how you can't escape it if the gospel has grabbed you? Let's pray.